If you are joining us as an attendee, thank you so much for your patience. <laughs> as you can tell, we've had a little bit of trouble with technical difficulty this morning. It happens. But it's okay. Wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining us. Um, if this is Welcome. your first time joining one of the McLean sessions, my name is Jen Kearney and I'm a digital communications manager for McLean Hospital. And today we're going to talk about connecting with kids and we're going to take your questions. Um, I think that this is really important despite the fact that I am not a parent, but I do know that the relationship between kids and their parents or caregivers is, mm. you know, it's the most, one of the most important relationships in their life. And it's the foundation for what gets updated into to adulthood. Um, mm. But you know, there's a lot of parents on here and I'm definitely preaching to a choir that parenting children versus parenting adolescents is something that's, you know, really different, especially when teens are looking for so much independence and it's hard to navigate whether or not they're making the right decisions, how you can chime in, all mm -hmm. of that again, but I'm preaching to the choir. So yeah. during this session, Lisa is going to take your questions about how uh, we can better connect with our kids. And it's just going to be a very open and candid discussion. Uh, in order for you to ask a question, if you are in the Zoom application, head to the bottom of the screen where it says Q&A and click on that. Scott will be moderating in the background. So if there is any patient information that's revealed, that's something that we can suppress. Um, we try not to have any PHIs, have any PHIs, so please try to avoid including that. Since we are on Zoom, it's a third party platform. We just wanna to try to keep everybody as safe as possible. Um, and then before I introduce Dr. Coyne to everybody, if you can't stay for the full thing, totally get it, especially since it's a lot of parents joining us. Um, we will be emailing a link to the full recording, uh, usually one to two business days after. Uh, and then last but not least, if you are unfamiliar with Dr. Coyne, she is a psychologist and the senior clinical consultant at the Child and Adolescent OCD Institute at McLean, otherwise known as OCDI. And she is one of my favorite recurring webinar co-hosts. So Lisa, it's We just always, like hanging out together for these. I know, it's great. I get, I get paid to spend time with you. So I have to say, I've got a pretty good job. Uh, but Lisa, seriously, thank you so much for joining us my today. And, you know, I'd like to start off by just asking, uh, what is one of the biggest dichotomies between parenting a kid and parenting a teen? Mm, it's a really good question. And I think that just as, um, you know, we think of children as developing and having different developmental stages, and we're less likely to think about parenting as a developmental practice, right? And so I'm going to be speaking to you all today, just a couple of things please remember that none of this is clinical or medical advice, right? Um, it's educational. And second thing is I'll be speaking to you as a clinical psychologist who's author, also an author of a couple of parent books on parents, um, one for parents of young children and one's across the spectrum. Um, and I'm also speaking to you as a mom. Um, and my kids are now one of them is turning 21 this next week. So very exciting about that. Well, happy um, early birthday. Yeah, I know. She's pretty excited about it. Um, so just to step back. So we don't, we're less likely to think about parenting as a developmental thing. And when your children are younger, it's important to think about like safety. How do we teach them and support their emotional and social development so that they develop their social emotional competence, meaning how do they interact with friends? And, you know, you can argue that their relationship with you as parents is really the template for how they're going to perceive relationships in their life, right? And how you set limits and boundaries with them and how you support their exploration and discovery is going to be a template for how that's going to ripple into the world through their other relationships. So when they're adolescents, one difference is the, let's say for example, you might be more directive and focused on teaching and safety and learning and all of this when kids are younger. But when they're adolescents, developmentally where they're at is they're beginning to develop their own autonomy their own individual selves. They're, they're figuring out who they are in the world. And this is gonna be a messy sometimes process of trying on different things. Um, adolescence is also, there's major brain changes that happen during adolescence 
where um, the emotional center of the brain is relatively louder sort of than um, an adolescent's ability to plan ahead and inhibit and think carefully about things. So you're going to see bigger, and for a lot of us, right, and for a lot of our adolescents, bigger emotions, more risk-taking, et cetera, which can be really scary. And it's also around that time that some mental health issues can start to arise, right? Sometimes they arise in childhood, but far more frequently they begin in adolescence. And so this can be a murky time for parents who are trying to figure out, is this normal behavior? Is this rebelliousness? Because that also shows up at this time. Or is this typical developmental stuff that goes on? So one of the shifts in parenting that co-occurs with all of these many major shifts is that parenting becomes more collaborative, right? More um, about helpful and supportive problem solving rather than directiveness and things like that. And of course, this is gonna vary across families depending on the issues that teens are working on. So I know that you had mentioned, you know, so you had alluded to safety and you also alluded mm -hmm. to the fact that there's a lot of like impulsive emotional decisions because yeah, adolescent be. brains are fully, are fully developed yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, is it 26 when your brain is fully developed? You know, now mid, they're starting to think, yeah, it's mid twenties, but they, it, they are now thinking that the brain's plastic and that development continues well into your thirties. So that's fascinating as well. But, Perfect. I've yes, got a, I've got a built in excuse got for several more years. <laughs> You're always growing. <laughs> exactly. But when regarding safety and impulsive decision making, um, you know, so many kids are just on the internet all the time. It's a con, there's really no way to disconnect from it. I mean, yep. there are ways, especially it's now. Getting, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really yeah. the only outlet into the world for a lot of communities if COVID is still um, really uh, prevalent digital learning is becoming a thing. Um, yep. There's there's a lot of that going on. How do you get the point across about being safe, especially on the internet and with digital habits without coming off as being, I don't want to say a nuisance, because you want to just come off as being a parent with really good intentions, which is, of course, where you're coming from. Yep. And it's funny because I did a talk on this last year, and I'm going to misquote some of these stats. But, you know, what we have found is that given the structure of a lot of families these days and the demands where lots of families live in two parent households, right? Where both parents are working. Um, it's really challenging to have, to be as present as we might want to for our kids. And that sometimes get the time sometimes gets filled with, here's the phone, here's the iPad. And that's happening even, you know, internet use and screen use is up even among children zero to eight years old. Um, so the, there are some very good resources about this. And maybe what I'll do is I'll send some to Jen after our talk. But a really good idea is to start early, right, with a family plan about um, limiting screen use and also about creating zones in your home that are screen free. For example, we have plenty of data um, across the years on family meal times as a time that families connect, right? And it's the time, even if it's brief for a few minutes, it's, it can be an anchor of kind of keeping the connection among family members. And so it's a great idea to say the table, the kitchen, right? while we're eating. This is a screen-free time, okay? So it's just as important to think about arranging times when you can be together as a family really mindfully as much as limiting screen time. But it's also tough, right? Because screens are, you know, again, they're the source of everything. Like you said, Jen, education, social connection for kids. They can be a great leveler. Many kids who, if they have social difficulties connecting in person, can connect with each other online. And there are networks in neighborhoods of kids gaming and, and doing things together. That being said, I think really doing some good education about not talking to people that you don't know, making, you know, and thinking about um, keeping access, especially to younger kids, screen stuff is important. And 
giving kids some um, instructions about like, if there's anyone that ever makes you uncomfortable, if you don't know someone, they're trying to friend you, if someone's trying to get you go to a chat room or whatever, it's really important um, to educate and kind of just be really mindful about that um, as a parent with your kids. And part of that challenge too is when it comes to engagement online, because I mean, I, I work in social media too. A lot of the gamification of social media platforms is that mm -hmm. they thrive on that dopamine hit when you get more likes, you have more followers. It's, mm -hmm. it's a popularity contest. So it's right. even, it's hard to get that point across with kids when you're saying, you know, don't have people don't engage with people you don't know because their brains are kept, they're chemically wired to thrive in that environment where they're getting those dopamine hits from social media. And I hate to say this, but it's hard for parents to disengage too. And so there have been a few studies that have come out um, about injuries in childhood and parents being on phones and things like that. So I know, right? So it's real, and you're going to hear dogs barking, work from home, very sorry. Um, but it's important to really recognize also, like, what is the role of screens for parents too? And my kids can tell you, I'm super irritating because when I'm working and when I'm on a screen, they can say my name three or four times and I won't hear a thing, you know? So thinking about how can, you know, if, if you really want to stay connected to your kids, it's really easy for us to get wrapped into, um, you know, to uh, social media and things like that. I mean, that's how social media is designed. <laughs> so very important um, for us to think about how that works too for parents. You know, it's such a catch 22 when you are like, oh, it's, we're in such a digital environment. You know, it's great that, I mean, it's great that we have all these ways to be connected in a day and mm -hmm. age like this with everything going on. And then at the same time, like, how do we just take our phones out of our hands and put them down and enjoy where we are and what we're doing right now? It's, uh, it's okay. pretty, it can be really challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so we did have somebody ask how to best connect with their 14 year old daughter who just hangs in her room. I try to engage with her to come watch a movie, play cards, games, et cetera, as a family, especially during COVID. Yeah, it's really tough. And so that's one of the things that's really, it's a great question, right? Because you're going to want to connect. You're going to feel left out if your kiddos are hiding in the rooms and many of them are, but just let's take a step back for a second um, and think about the context here for the first time, probably in ages, right? All everyone's at home all the time. And for teenagers who are wanting increased privacy, right? It's a challenge for them to figure out now what? Everybody's here in the same house and we can't get out. So just being mindful that that might be a safe place um, for the kids just to hang out in their rooms. So what I would say is keep offering, right? Say hello, you know, go in and check in, even if you sit down for a few minutes and be like, hey, what's going on? We're watching a movie make it easy. Um, and they may not connect, but it may mean more to them just to know that you're there. Right. And you can see my dog in the background. So be like that. Which dog just is that? Up. Dougal. That's Dougal. He's my That's constant awesome. companion lately. Um, he, um, he's working on his own anxiety disorder. We just put him on Prozac. So that's a whole other conversation. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, so I would say just even though the kids may reject, you don't take that personally as parents, right? But just stay present and then have some maybe basic ground rules, like a, another great time. Everybody's got to eat. So let's eat, have a rule about like, we're not going to eat in our room. We're just, even if it's five minutes, we're just going to hang out, you know, um, learn how to play the game that they're playing. App. make a TikTok with them. No, I have not done that. I'm terrified, but I'm sure it's coming. So um, get interested in what they're interested in. Um, but I just keep asking, I think. And it's give yourself permission to feel a little bit rebuffed. And it's okay if they say no. And also give yourself permission for when they say you're so uncool to be oh, okay gosh. with that response. Yes. <laughs> 
I don't I don't have children, but I already get from my cousins oh, who are yeah. in their teens. They're like, you're so uncool. <laughs> and I am totally fine with it. Absolutely. <laughs> so we have, we've got some questions about teens. Another person asked, I have a daughter who's 14 and seems to be getting more and more shy. The shyness mm-hmm. is also causing some social anxiety, or it could be that social anxiety is causing shyness. Either way, could you give me a few ideas about how to approach the topic with her or activities that would support her and help her out of the challenges she's experiencing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that good questions are your friend here. And one might be, you know, just checking in on how she's doing and asking her how things are going with friends, right? And noticing, asking her if she's feeling lonely or is she kind of feeling comfortable um, on her own? Is there anything that she misses about connecting with people? you might observe to her if this is true for her, you know, if that sometimes she seems a little reluctant to call people or reach out to people, you know, is that because she's feeling nervous or is that because she's just kind of not into it at the moment, right? And she may or may not know the answers to these and she may or may not be an accurate reporter on these, but I think just noticing, right? What I'd want to know is, do you feel disconnected from friends in ways that are making you sad? And if so, what's that about? Are you feeling nervous about it? Uh Because it's perfectly okay. Some kids are shy temperamentally, and that's wonderful. Um, Sometimes kids are, you know, certainly they can have social anxiety. Um, And social anxiety, just to distinguish between the two, so like someone who's temperamentally shy might just be, more comfortable in smaller groups or one-on-one or like to spend time on their own and be perfectly happy with that, right? And it might be overwhelming and feel, um, you know, just effortful to be in really large groups. And so they might just kind of gravitate towards smaller groups. Social anxiety is about a fear of negative social evaluations, right? Like, will I say the wrong thing? Will people think I'm stupid? I'll feel embarrassed. It'll be catastrophic, you know? And so just noticing differences there. And then, you know, if it is social anxiety and if the kiddo really is genuinely unhappy and wanting to be with more kids and feeling really lonely and left out, but finding it difficult to reach out and um, take those risky steps, right, of potential embarrassment and all of that, that's when we start to think about exposure-based therapy for social anxiety, which basically means facing your fears, you know, and doing it anyway, leaning in. Like me doing these webinars and my fear of public speaking. Like me doing these webinars. I used to have panic attacks during public speaking, so I'm with you there. Um, do you think so, that there's, do you think there's any correlation? And this is my own curiosity, you know, sure. as, as if you're 14, the chances of you going through puberty at that point are remarkably high. Do you think that maybe if there's any attribution to shyness because you're unsure of what other people are experiencing and you might actually feel far always. more alone? Yes. And actually that's the experience of most teenagers is they feel they're so, um, you know, usually it's such a, a time of self-doubt and self-discovery and you're figuring things out and you think everybody else is walking around with things so put together and I just am a hot mess when in actuality, everybody's walking around like that. And I hazard a guess, like if we ask the listeners, you know, would you, if you given the choice, would you go back to your teen years? What proportion of them would you think Hard say pass yes. for me. I know, Absolutely me too. Not. No way. I mean, I'm still the, I'm still the same height as when I was 14, but like other than that. I think I was too. I think I am too. I don't remember. I was always the tiniest one in my class. But um, so one thing just in terms of how would you connect with kids is connect with teen you. Think about what was I like back then? How was I as a 14 year old? I mean, that is going to, and and really kind of remember what it was like seeing the world through those eyes, right? How much you thought you knew then and how hard things might have been 
and all the things that were changing and all the things that were uncertain, really getting in touch with that part of yourself and remembering that is going to stand parents in good stead in talking to their teenagers now. It's essential, right? Um, and reaching out to them from that space, I think, is really helpful. Looking back, I'm like, maybe I should just call my parents after this webinar and apologize for how I was as a teen. <laughs> Um, so uh, speaking of feelings and dealing with teenagers, uh, let's talk about kids that are mad. Um, how do I meet my kid in the middle if they're angry? Especially, you know, you want to validate their feelings, but everybody's burnt out and frustrated at this point. And it's, we're all constantly going through low key trauma all the time because of COVID and the world that we're living in right now. But how can somebody so small be so angry all the time? And how do I address that? And it's a good question. I guess the, I guess the answer to that is it depends, right? Um, in general, one of the things that parents, uh, that's useful for parents to communicate to their kids and model for their kids is that all emotions are okay. It doesn't matter how big they are. It doesn't matter what they are, right? That's not the issue. Um, that being said, there are things that are often done in the context of anger that are not okay. Hurling insults, um, pushing, shoving, aggression of any kind, verbal aggression, um, vindictiveness, all of that, right? So I think making a clear distinction between it's okay to be mad, right? It's okay and we have space for that is great and really healthy. And anger actually can be super motivating because emotions are all about information, right? They're telling you something that's important to you. So if you're mad, sometimes that can motivate people to action, right? So think about, you know, a young person I think about quite a lot these days is Greta Thunberg, the environmental activist, who is a neurodiverse individual who has also um, struggled with depression, anxiety, OCD, and she's the leader of a worldwide movement. And how that started was she got very, very mad about the disconnect between our behavior and its effects on the environment. And because she's a neurodiverse individual who sees things, you know, in kind of clear black and white terms, that actually was super beneficial to her in seeing like, I don't under, you know, I don't see this distinction. And the anger pointed out something that was critically important to her and inspired millions, millions of people. Um, so I think just remember that. And lastly, I think, and I remember this too, um, you know, from turbulent teenage discussions, both when I was a teen and also as a mom of a teen, you know, it's easy to, for parents to take their kids' anger personally, you know, and I think it's, it's hard to not do that. So that piece is going to show up, that kind of, ouch, you know. Um, and I think what I would encourage parents to do is to make a space for that feeling as well, right? But not necessarily to act on it. And to have some self-kindness about that, um, you know, because it's going to show up. It does show up for all of us. I know that you had mentioned neurodiverse individuals, which I actually really love that terminology. Um, how would you help a six-year-old develop emotional and um, emotionally and socially if their parent struggles from depression and anxiety, knowing that there is that neurodiversity within the family? Mm -hmm. So what I would say is um, I'm a big fan of modeling um, a broad range of emotional expression and how to handle it, right? So it's in families where parents are struggling with depression and anxiety. What you see sometimes is that there's a narrower range of emotions that are demonstrated. And sometimes they're more negative emotions than positive emotions. And that's just how it is, you know, when we're feeling down and depressed. Um, so modeling things like when I'm sad, you know, I can still do the things that I want to do in my life. They may not feel good right now. They may not be as reinforcing, you know, or 
when I'm sad, I'm still going to reach out to friends and just let them know I'm here, ask for help. And I know that some of these things, probably the parents listening are going, but that's really hard when I'm depressed. Yes, I know. I know. And yet, modeling those kinds of things, which are good for one's own treatment, are also good for kids to learn, what do I do when I'm in this space? You know, how do I handle my anxiety? How do I, when I'm really frightened of something, how do I try it anyway? When my mind tells me that's going to be a gross food, why, you know, how am I going to take a bite of it anyway, right? One of my favorites, these are some really tiny things to do, but some of my favorites with really little kids when they're in their car seats in the back seat, um, given that we're in Boston and traffic is always ridiculous, is modeling um, and being very vocal about how mad you are <laughs> about the traffic or that guy that just cut you off. And modeling what you ha what you do to handle it like oh, i'm so mad and i'm just gonna take a deep breath and i'm gonna just be patient you know it's hard to be patient model patience with irritability model that you're scared to talk to the other parents in the playground and you're gonna go do it anyway model um how to stand up for yourself even if you're worried about confrontation like oh that person gave me the wrong change I'm going to go back, you know, and get the right change, or I'm going to go make a complaint. Um, empathize, you know, and one of the things that's helpful, and it's different with different kids, right? So with little guys, help them label their emotions, right? Give them different words for their emotions. Have them notice, like, what's the corresponding feeling in your body? So how do you know you're anxious? Well, my heart races, and I've got a tight feeling in my chest. Um, and with adolescents, just be curious and empathic, you know, and see how they're feeling. Because there's probably a lot that it's, and it's normal that they probably won't tell you every thought in their heads. It would be kind of weird if they did. That's okay. You know, but just be sort of an empathic listener um, and kind of notice what teen you might be feeling given the same situation. I'm thinking about empathy with teens. Um, mm. Someone asked about wanting to help their 13 year old daughter with decision making and that they struggle when they allow her to make mistakes and learn from them and guiding her to avoid mistakes. Do you have any suggestions? Well, I love the question itself because I think the answer was in it. And that is the hardest thing I think with teenagers because this is when parents start to let go and 13's young. And by the way, oppositionality in, in uh, across child development peaks 11, 12, 13. So you're going to see most of that. It's a bigger deal then because it's brand new um, to kind of do your own thing. But I think the answer is you have to allow your kids to struggle. And I had a great mentor. This is actually such a nice story. When my daughter went off to college, I'm very blessed to have really amazing colleagues and friends. And so what I did was I asked them if they could write something. I bought a little journal and I said, could you write some advice? What, what did you wish you knew, right, when you were going off to college? And we got a bunch of people to do this. And two of those things stood out to me. One was from um, my friend, Teddy Davis, who is probably not listening. He's a lovely guy. He's an economist, brilliant. One of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. And he said, if I could give her one piece of advice, he said, I'd say, leave it all on the field. I just love that, right? And what that means, um, if you're not familiar with the term, is when you care about something, really give it your all. But the other piece that I thought was really important was from Kelly Wilson, who is another clinical psychologist. He's um, retired now, but he's still doing lots and lots of writing and teaching, is, I hope you learn to fall well, because that is in fact how we learn, right? If you don't make mistakes, that you're not really learning. And sometimes you have to let kids fall so that they can learn how to be resilient and how to get back up. And for a lot of us as parents, that's incredibly difficult because, you know, it's scary, and yet it's part of the process.
you know, and helping them get back up and helping them be mindful. So like a good metaphor would be instead of kind of directing your team's decisions, right? Or kind of portioning, uh, you know, portioning them out for them. Think about sitting together on the couch, looking off at the same spot on the horizon and kind of putting your heads together like that, right? Um, take it like that, but it is hard. And I think that that's one of the things that gets in parents' way um, during the teen years. I think that's also really good advice for parents who are concerned about, you know, failing as a parent because everybody's got different parenting styles mm -hmm. and some of them work better for some kids than others. And mm -hmm. no two parenting styles are really going to be the same. So acknowledging that you are going to have slip ups, but you're human and that's all part of the parenting process would probably, you know, provide a little bit more of that humanistic affect toward your teen as well. And if they notice that you're acknowledging that, they're going to feel more inclined to make their own mistakes, acknowledge them and learn from them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so, um, it's important to be flexible, you know, and sensitive, right? Um, empathic, but also to set limits and structure, right? Um, you know, years ago, Diana Baumrind did work on three different parenting styles, right? Permissive, authoritative, and authoritarian. So permissive and authoritarian parents had kids that didn't do so well, right? Because if everything's permissible, you never learn how to stay in the rails because there are no rails, right? And with authoritarian parenting, that's very strict and can be very punitive sometimes. Um, and dictatorial and directive, that doesn't work either because it doesn't really shape your child's agency and their self-efficacy in making their own decisions. So what you want is sort of the, it's like the Goldilocks model of parenting, the just right, um, where you're empathic genuine and you also set clear and consistent limits across if you have two a two family or two parent household right or if you have even extended family that are caregivers that everybody's on the same page to the degree that that happens and things are predictable you're going to be successful but that being said Jen's 100% right because like you know you can have two kids and they can require completely different things they're completely different people just like we all are Right. So when it comes to distance learning, because we're getting into back ah, to school, distance learning. <laughs> how worried should parents be about teens and distance learning? Uh, they're asking, will learning from home for a year and a half offer any challenges when they physically go back to school? I have a lot of thoughts about this. And parents are probably reading so many different things. And I'm going to start with Physical health and safety is really important. And as we learn about the virus, we are learning that, you know, and data continues to come out all the time. Sometimes it has long-term effects on health, okay? Now, earlier on in our talk, we talked about the plasticity and resiliency and the development, the continued development over time of children's brains, in particular during adolescence. If kids miss out on learning, first of all, this is a cohort, right? This isn't like um, some kids are going to miss out and others are not. Because if schools end up getting shut down, if there are infections, everybody's going to be back at home, okay? So this whole cohort of kids is going through this together. So like there's the fear I've heard, my child will be left behind. Well, not really, because it's a cohort. Um, honestly, will they be behind? Yes, but those behind what? Those kind of goalposts are artificial. We make them up. If one is behind, everybody's gonna be behind. And brains are plastic. We learn our entire lives. Now, is it sad for them that they're going to miss like all the graduating classes that have missed their proms and their debs and, and all of those things? Yes, yes, it is sad. But I think part of being a parent during the time of COVID, and it's funny because I had this talk with my daughter last night, is about 
allowing yourself to grieve for the life you thought you'd be having and allowing yourself to live the one that's here now as it is. And that's hard for parents too, right? Who had expectations about what this is going to be like. We're all scrambling. We're all learning, right? Online learning, it's not ideal for some kids. Some kids with disabilities, it's really not going to work. And for those kids, perhaps they do need to be really safely um, at schools, right? But in safe conditions. So there are going to be different answers for different families. And I'm also mindful of the fact that the a massive amount of the country, like food insecurity is higher now across families than it ever has been. Our economy and in the US, and I realize we have international listeners, I know that it's happening, um, recessions are happening in other countries as well, right? So families are struggling. Rates of domestic violence, because of the pressure cooker of having kids home, are higher. Parents are really struggling with how do we work and entertain our kids, especially if they're younger kids. So there's no easy answers here. There's no easy answers. And what I would say is, um, you know, they're not going to be left behind educationally, right? They will, they will pick it up. They will learn. But I think each family needs to make a decision independently and individually for what's best for that family, given all of the constraints, you know, people all around me are making really difficult decisions, you know? Yeah, and we're all still surviving and doing the best that we can, too. Yeah, that's all we can do, really. So another question about school closures. Uh, an individual found that their, their six-year-old daughter's sole emotional and social support now that schools have been closed in the spring and continuing to do so in the fall. Uh, this individual plays about one to two hours a day, snuggles, and reads at bedtime. What sort of strategies do you recommend they use to continue to provide the support their daughter needs? keep doing what you're doing, keep asking questions um, and engage with her and also encourage her um, little by little to engage, to play independently by yourself. Okay. Just little bits. And then if you can help see if you can do some virtual play dates or some distance play dates with friends, right? Um, online, like tic-tac-toe even, anything at all um, where she can connect with her friends, I think would be great. So in terms of connecting with kids that are playing games, uh, somebody asked about having a difficult time connecting with their nine-year-old son who plays a lot of mm -hmm. video games, as most kids are in quarantine with working parents. Um, this person's daughter insists on her and I playing together, so I'm spending more time with her. Do you have any strategies to connect with him? Hmm. Well, I don't know that this will work, but one of the things that I often assign parents is to, and it's a really important piece, is like schedule some, like even if it's five or 10 minutes of just time just for that kiddo, okay? Um, where all you do is be with them. And it's not to problem solve, it's not to direct, it's not to ask lots of questions. It's simply to just appreciate them and be in their presence. Um, and do that every day you know, and just hang out, let them guide what you do. If they're doing something, see if you can join for a few minutes um, and just hang out. That's it. Um, and I would say, try and do that with your nine-year-old too. Just schedule some special time just for him. Let him know that you miss him, that it's important to you. Um, and that, you know, he's really busy gaming, but maybe does he think you guys could just hang out for a little while uh, for five or 10 minutes, and then you're gonna let him go. And ask him about his game, what's he playing? Get interested in what he's doing. What's he like about it? Is this how he connects with his friends? Can he teach you, you know? Um, so that's something I think that could be really useful. So speaking of gaming with friends, someone asked, my 12 year old has started cursing a lot while gaming with friends. How can I approach this in a way that will get him to listen to me? Well, <laughs> as someone who has been known to curse sometimes too, it's hard, right? Um, one thing I can tell you is the more, sometimes with some kids, depends on how the cursing is working for him. Um, he's probably not really mindfully aware of what he's saying while he's gaming because his attention's all on the gaming. 
in addition, if he's got a mischievous streak, cursing, if he knows that it upsets you, he may do it more. And so it, the answer to that one is it really depends. Um, what I would say is you might set some limits around where and when he's not allowed to curse, right? So if it's in your presence, that's okay. Say, hey, I prefer not to hear that. Okay, it's fine if you do it in your room, on your own, whatever. I would, I would give some freedom for that. But I would teach him a better, you know, a skill, a better sensitivity about like where and when might that language happen? And when is it really, really not okay? You know, like do not say these words at school. Do not say these words in their presence, okay? What you say in your room is up to you. That's your room. Um, and also maybe have a conversation about, you know, how words impact people and the effects of those words on people if they're harmful. Um, we've got several curveball questions for you. So Ooh. I'm okay. I'm scared. <laughs> I don't have answers. <laughs> don't be, don't be scared. I'm totally confident. There's just no, um, there's no thematic train of thought throughout all of them. So you're just going to get oh. a bunch of, you're going to get a bunch of questions. Okay. Um, first and <laughs> foremost, uh, an individual wrote in saying my daughter self-diagnosed as having disassociation due to childhood trauma. I was oh. trying to get her officially diagnosed, but didn't hear back from certain professionals. What type of professional should I speak with regarding evaluations for her? So I'm sorry if your daughter has experienced trauma. That's really hard. And um, she sounds very precocious. I don't know how old she is. What I would generally suggest is to start with a clinical psychologist because um, who's, who specializes in trauma. And there is... Um, a website, I'd have to give it to you after, Jen, but I believe it's the Traumatic Stress um, Association, where you can get some information about evidence-based treatments for trauma. Um, but I would start with a clinician who has some experience treating trauma, but uh, preferably a you know, clinical psychologist who's a diagnostician. That being said, there are plenty of people who are social workers who are licensed mental health counselors etc who can be helpful to you and if you don't know really who to go to you could start with a school psychologist if there's one in your school or you can start with the pediatrician's office just to ask and say i think my daughter's struggling with trauma i'm interested in finding out more and one website that's actually a great um, clearinghouse for families looking for evidence-based treatments for children is called um, EffectiveChildTherapy.org. And that is, um, that is part of the American Psychological Association Division 53 group, which is about children, adolescents, and families. Um, and you can just look and see what's the evidence-based treatment for this. How do I know if this is dissociation? How do I know if they're experiencing trauma? And dissociation is, of course, a symptom of traumatic stress response or post-traumatic stress syndrome um, or disorder. So those are things to kind of be mindful of. But the good news is how wonderful that she's asking for help. A lot of kids don't and they suffer in silence. And only we know from lots of data that only a very few, a very small percentage of the kids who need care get it or ask for it. So how wonderful um, that she told you. I and mean, just praise her for being so great and kind of thinking about it. And just a reminder to the audience that anything that Dr. Coyne does suggest as being a resource, we always link to on the recap page that ends up right. being sent to everybody in their email. So you'll be able to find those resources. Mm -hmm. um, we had somebody write in saying, my husband and I are very active and emphasize being outside, healthy eating, et cetera, which you sound like somebody I want to be friends with. Um, my 13 year old seems to now want to create an identity as being not like us. So refusing to go out, be active, et cetera. It's hard to connect when she's trying to be seemingly intentionally making it clear that she isn't like us. And it's okay to not be like us, but hard to deal with total refusal to leave the house or move around. Do you have any recommendations? Hmm. I think that, you know, what, what is snagging me about that question is, you know, total refusal to leave the house or move around. That's tough. And that sounds 
I don't know, but it sounds, um, I wonder if that's not about more than just not being like parents, you know? And it's tough because you want to find a balance between allowing kids to grow up and be who they are and to unfold as they are. And you also want to encourage them to be healthy and take care of their bodies, right? Um, so I think what I would do is I would have a really mindful conversation and encourage, but not direct. And talk a little bit about, get some more information, be curious about like, why do you like staying at home? What's that about? So, and, and be clear about and direct about your concerns and your fears. Like, you know, I know you find this annoying and I'm really worried because I worry about your health, you know, and healthy bodies need exercise. Can we come up with something together that you might be comfortable doing? You know, and certainly you don't have to be like us, but here's why I keep coming back to you with this question. It worries me. Um, a lot of kids don't get that when parents tell them to do stuff, especially teenagers, it's coming from a place of concern and love. They just hear the, you're telling me what to do. I want to go the opposite direction. And so sometimes just kind of framing the conversation in terms of like, what's the most important thing to you, right? It's because I care. It's because I want you to live a healthy life you know, and I'm worried about this. And I know it's hard to do things like be active, you know, help me. And you may not get very far, but just starting conversations like that and continuing them over time will get you further than directing or um, coercing, you know, and saying, well, you just have to do this, you know. So when talking about, you know, the coercion, if it's considered a nudge, like um, encouraging people to invite or encouraging kids rather to invite friends to outings, um, but the kids don't want to involve their friends. Um, how do you, as a parent, encourage a teen to face the fear of possibly being judged? Uh, this person wrote in, if we nudge, my kids say, leave me, no leave me alone, you're not respecting me, but it's clear that they're not willing to step outside of their comfort zone. Hmm. Yep. So I'm going to recommend, um, wow, there's a lot because we deal with a lot of kids like that. And the, the hard truth is you cannot make kids do what they will not, what they're not willing to do. That being said, you can model how to do it yourself. And there are lots of resources out there for this. And I'm thinking in particular, there's a great book by Dr. Louise Hayes, who's a colleague of mine in Australia called The Thriving Adolescent. And it's all about how do you, um, you know, develop a flexible repertoire of behaviors such that you can do hard things when they matter to you, okay? So helping it helps kids identify, like, well, what things are important to you, right? And if it's important for you to, say, go out and explore the world or play soccer or do whatever the thing is that you want to do, are you willing to be uncomfortable? and face the fear of negative evaluation, right? And so it's really about teaching kids how to, um, you know, do things that are tough uh, flexibly, even when it's hard. We had an individual write in who says, I have a four-year-old who cries in hysterics every time we leave a family visit as she thinks we won't see them again. To tell mm. her when we will be seeing them again and communicate in advance the time of when we need to leave, but she's still overly emotional with her goodbyes. I don't mm. want her to stop expression, ex expressing her emotions, but I want to find a balance. How can I best help her? Such a good question. I love that question. And it is so hard, and especially in the context of COVID and with little ones and their limited understanding of what all this means. What I would say is make a space for her to be sad and next morning or when you get home touch base with that family member to let her know that they're still here and goodbyes are hard so rather than trying to um and i don't think i didn't hear this in the question but i think a lot of parents would try to um convince kids that the fear is unreasonable i think just meet them where they are and then at that age, 
kids don't learn by what you say. They learn by consequences, right? So go home, make a space for them to be sad, soothe. And then the next day, check in with the family and be like, how, they're still here. Yeah, that was so hard. Goodbyes are hard, aren't they? And I'm so glad they're still here. And just help them notice that and track that. Like, you know, here's what actually happened. Um, Cause kids that age don't learn very well quite yet from just what you tell them. Do you think that, um, and this is like my own curiosity. Oh, oh. <laughs> you've got visitors. visitors. I'm gonna mute so you all don't hear that. Go ahead. So uh, this is my own curiosity, but do you necessarily think that reframing it that when a child, like a four-year-old gets overly emotional about a goodbye, if they had a great day with the family, reframing it is when they start to get upset asking what the best parts of the day were, or what your favorite part of the day was, and having it be a positive memory and recollection, do you think that would be helpful? I do, and it's really funny that you should ask that, because this funny thing happens during those years and also during adolescence, right? So when kids are small, when they have an emotion, we're gonna like mindfully acknowledge the barking and keep moving. <laughs> when kids are small, um, when they experience emotions, right, they, their sense of, they, they feel like it's the most intense thing they've ever felt. They've always felt this way. It will never end, and it's the worst thing ever, right? And so they have all these, these ideas about, hi, Dougal, sorry, we have company. Um, I feel like that guy with the daughter that came in in the <laughs> video, that's old hat now. Um, and the same thing happens in adolescence, right? When people evaluate emotions, it's hard to remember that emotions are like weather. Oh, and that's one and the other one. Um, they come and they go, right? And so helping kids notice how they're feeling in the moment and then notice when it shifts is really, really helpful. So your suggestion about like, what was a good thing that happened? What were the best parts of the day? This was really sad and making a space for all of these. And a good metaphor is like, you're the sky and your emotions are the weather. And they're gonna come and they're gonna go and they're gonna keep changing all the time. I like that a lot. Um, <laughs> so we've got a few more questions. I know we have about five minutes to the hour. Do you have a little bit of time? A sure, bit of yeah, room? I think so. Awesome, just wanna make sure. These are slightly complex questions, oh. so I wanna make sure Ooh. that yeah, I want to make sure that we can dedicate the right amount of time to it. Uh, we had someone yes, write in Yes, I have saying, five minutes. <laughs> Will that work? I'll do my best. <laughs> so uh, someone asked, my eight-year-old is a sensitive, thoughtful, but fearful child. He's also highly intelligent, but has significantly slow processing speed and has mm. been really struggling during this time. Yeah. He's been pulling away from me lately and pushing me away sometimes with derogatory comments when before he was adoring and almost needy for my attention. Any suggestions for navigating this? I would say meet him where he is um, and make a space for the pushing away and let him know that you're still there, right? Kids are working out. They don't have the skills necessarily um, to express properly emotions. And I think communicating that no matter what, he, it's okay to be mad you know, and that you're still there, I think is going to be really, really important. So just kind of keeping that in mind and try not to take the pushing away personally. Oh, Jen, you're muted. Sorry. I know. I realized I was like, I'm going to ask like, the what? next question. And <laughs> it's fine. It's a work in progress, I like everything like else. <laughs> quarantine has just been a series of me and my husband yelling what to each other from separate rooms and it's been <laughs> 700, 750 square feet apart and yet we still can't hear each other. So <laughs> this is you saying what to me is completely in my norm at this point. <laughs> so uh, we had somebody write in about my sister has depression and her husband is a recovering alcoholic. They have two mm. teenage boys, one with anxiety and one with depression and all of them are in therapy. How do I best support my sister from afar when she calls to talk about family issues? I would say, listen, listen. And, you know, it's one of the things that we as humans and therapists do sometimes is we jump very quickly to problem solving. And sometimes the right answer is simply 
allowing yourself to be in it and saying something like, wow, I wish I had answers for you, but I'm happy to be here with you and listen to whatever it is that you want to talk about. All right, we've got two more questions. I'm gonna see if I can do this in the next three minutes. So Excellent. my 11 year old is normally a happy-go-lucky and very open child. I've noticed him becoming more reserved and less likely to engage with kids who aren't necessarily friends, um, which in the past he has done. He seems to rather play alone than with others. I try to talk to him and ask him about it, but he says that he's fine. What sort of questions can I ask to get him to engage and share his feelings? Well, it sounds like he is sharing his feelings um, where he's at. And I think keep continuing to meeting again, meeting him where he is. And he, at this point, sounds like he is doing kind of what he's comfortable with um, and just kind of observing and just listening, I think more, because sometimes kids can find lots of questions, very aversive. And the more questions you ask, um, the less they will talk to you. So I think more be present, hang out, be empathic, meet him where he is, be open and curious. Those are the things that are going to um, forge more of a, maybe his willingness to kind of say a little bit more and model how you talk about your own feelings as a parent. So I'm struggling. Like, so, so kids, I wish that more parents, like, I wish more parents modeled their vulnerabilities to their kids, you know, and talked about their own self-doubt, um, their own self-criticism, because kids don't know, right? And they may think that you as their parent are the end all, the be all, and that you're perfect, and that you know everything. And they have no idea some of the things and worries and, and things that we think about. So I think modeling, too, is a really important piece of that. And that can be so hard too, especially when you consider, you know, the age that I'm in my thirties, it's a lot of my, a lot of my colleagues and peers are becoming parents and mm. seeing the learned behaviors of what happened in generations before us. I talked to my parents about how their parents never talked about feelings because they were products of the great depression. And that right. whole time was about resilience and buckling yep. down and getting through and whether or not mm -hmm. you had to catch rabbits and eat them from your own backyard, oh gosh, which is yeah. an anecdote for my grandfather, but it's that whole resilience and kind of doubling down in your emotion because you've got to power through whatever life's throwing at you. And it's something I feel like generations after that have almost had to unlearn because, and this is not to actually shout out my mom, but I have talked to her about, you know, how are you feeling and kind of flipping the script on her that we yeah. can have these open conversations where she can express her vulnerabilities and anxieties. And she's mm -hmm. met with that kind of support from her kids that I think has been, you know, really valuable for our relationship, even as two grown adults. Yeah. But we've got one more question and I know you have to go soon. So okay. I'll try to make this quick. Um, somebody wrote in asking if they'd never set the ground rules before for their children, how do you initiate them now? Which I have to say, I'm sure that your children have not totally run the household from day one. So you already have ground <laughs> rules. You just don't know it yet. I think be open and honest and have a conversation where you kind of have a summit and say, you know what? We've been worried about this and we're going to work, you know, and we're, we're going to start. We think it's really important. Engage kids in the process. Try and come up with some ground rules together that you can collaboratively decide on right? That's going to help um, because kids will feel like they are being involved in the decision-making process. The other thing too is be a good source of information, right? If you make a rule, it shouldn't just be because I said so. Like really talk with them about like, here are the things I'm thinking about, okay? Um, the more you do that, I think the more engagement you may have. And then you can also have another talk the next week and about how are the rules working? Should they be tweaked? Let's all try this and see how this works. So to the degree that that's possible, I would, I would start with that. I hope that helps. I think that was really helpful. I actually think this whole session is helpful and I'm like very excited for the day, <laughs> the day that I become a parent because I feel like I'm going to be armed with there so much go. valuable information <laughs> from you. And so, your kids are going to be your best teachers. <laughs> They're, they're I, certainly mine. We're certainly mine. <laughs> 
I can already tell that's going to be the case. Yeah. My two-year-old niece has given me enough of that already. So she's, she's a time, but stories, yeah. to, stories for offline, Lisa. Uh, stories for offline. <laughs> as, as always, Lisa, thank you so much. You are just a treasure trove of knowledge. And I have to say, going into this blindly with the public just asking you questions, you have been terrific every time. This did not disappoint. And I hope everybody that joined us live enjoyed it as well. This actually concludes our session. If you did have to step away, the doorbell rang, your dog started barking. Um, <laughs> you, will get, you will get a full recording, so not to worry. This should be in your inbox within one to two business days. And we will include all of the resources that Dr. Coyne mentioned during the session. And if you are joining us live in two weeks on August 20th at 11 a.m. Eastern time, we'll actually be doing another live Q&A about how to talk to kids about screen time and how to deal with that. I'm looking forward to figuring out how to shut my own phone off and I am not a child. So I think Lisa, you are going to be better. And ironically, we're doing it on a screen, so. <laughs> Yes, the irony of that is not lost on me. But thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And until next time, just be safe, be well, wash your hands, have a great day. And Lisa, thank you so much again. Very Bye, welcome. everybody. It's so great to see you. Bye, everybody. Take care.